Good afternoon. Welcome to the regular Friday program of the City Club of Portland. I'm Mary Kramer, president of the club. As is, as is our usual procedure, I will introduce our new members first. I'd like for them to stand, and then we will welcome them with a round of applause. First of all is Stephen Ferber, Commercial Loan Officer, Bank of California. Mary Ann Hardy, Financial Analysis for WSI. Charles Hill, Executive Director, Orthopedic Consultants. And John Nemitz, Senior Program Director for Good Samaritan Hospital. Welcome. We'd like to thank City Club members Bruce Ramsier, Chuck Williams, and Pam Wilson for bringing the club to these folks' attention and having them consider membership. We have a few announcements to make today. First of all, for next Friday, we're going to have Dr. Alice Rivlin speaking on thinking about the economic future. She's an economist and senior fellow with the Brookings Institute and she uh, will be here to address the Pacific Northwest Regional Economic Conference on its 25th anniversary. She's got lots of good experience. She directed the Congressional Budget Office from 1975 to 1983. We will be here in the Portland Hilton. Then on Friday, May 10th, we'll have Sheila, Sheila Tobias, excuse me, She's going to speak on how men use military experience in politics. She's an academic feminist, and one of her early books was entitled, What Really Happened to Rosie the Riveter? She's a visiting professor and, excuse me, scholar in the Department of Political Science at the University of Arizona and a political science instructor at the University of California. She lectures frequently on women, militarism, and the war. Please join us again at the Portland Hilton, and that's on the 10th of May. Our board host today, sitting at the head table, is Chuck Williams. He's a member of our Board of Governors and is communications manager for Good Samaritan Hospital. He has the privilege of asking the first question. The second question today will be asked by Dr. Constance Rodman, She's a psychiatrist here in private practice and a member of our Standing Committee on Human Services. As usual, we will open the meeting to questions from City Club members. They can go to the mic at the floor. I will remind you that we want questions, not statements, please. And uh, we hope that you will have a concise question to ask because we usually have lots of members who want to ask questions. Sometimes members like to write questions. We have forms on your tables where you may write your question, hold them up, and staff will pick them up and bring them to the front. We do give preference to questions from the mic. Now for today's program, health care. Every year we watch the numbers on health care increase. I saw this week where it's been reported that we now spend 12.2 of our gross national product on health care. I also saw where the number of in uninsured Americans is at 33 million. Over the past years, our legislature has begun to try to deal with health care issues. We've had a commission that's ranked medical procedures. We're thinking of controlling the number of high-tech tools available in any one area. And we've had legislation for insurance reform. Like the 1989 bill mandating that employers offer health care benefits to all full-time employees by 1994. That mandate has come under lots of discussion and both the opponents and proponents now have clarified their thoughts and crystallized their arguments. Today, we'll hear from Robert O'Brien, a proponent who is managing consultant with A. Foster Higgins. That's a company that specializes in human resources and employee benefits. Mr. O'Brien is an attorney, and he is a former Portlander and City Club member. 
He provides services to several of Foster Higgins' largest Northwest clients, including the Oregon School Boards Association and the State of Washington. Interestingly enough, he serves on the executive committee of the Greater Portland Business Group on Health. The opponent's position will be presented by John Sloan, Jr. He's been president and chief executive officer of the National Federation of Independent Business since 1983. He's a former president and CEO of the First Tennessee Bank of Nashville. While there, he began several innovative programs for medium and small size businesses. And he was well recognized. The Small Business Administration named him Advocate of the Year for Tennessee in 1981. Currently, Mr. Sloan ser serves on several national boards, such as Junior Achievement, the National Alliance of Business, and the National Legal Center for the Public Interest. Mr. Sloan will speak first, but please join me in welcoming both of our speakers. Mary, thank you. It is a pleasure to be here in Portland with you today, and I enjoy every excuse to come to visit this wonderful country. Coming from the hills of Tennessee, uh, you know, I really don't mind the rain. I surprised someone when I said to them, you know, in Nashville, we, we're supposed to get 50 inches a year ourselves, so I actually made me feel very at home today. Um, and I see you've taken a couple of new bankers in, and I hope they don't feel too bad when I mention, you know, it's interesting to change careers as I do it, but, and I, considering the way that bankers are talked about today, I feel like uh, after 20 years in the banking world, I now have gone straight. I'm now a lobbyist. <laughs> Just a couple of uh, weeks ago, I was um, amazed in reading the paper, and I noted an article that said that some astronomers had discovered a mysterious dark object in outer space. <clears throat> they said, in fact, it could be, and I was standard by this number, 100 billion times the mass of the sun. According to the article, the astronomers really are not sure what this thing is, maybe just one of those big black holes in the universe, but they're sure that it's big, and to quote one of those scientists, it's frightening. As I kept reading that article, <clears throat> just to be sure that those stargazers maybe hadn't stumbled on the present American healthcare crisis by mistake, it too is big, frightening, and so vast that the human mind has a difficult time, if at all, comp uh, comprehending its size and its impact. And like a black hole, it is beginning to suck up everything in its path. People, time, money, and even small businesses. When you're dealing with space, you have to stretch your perspective. For example, this thing that they think they found is about 18 trillion miles or three light years away. When you're dealing with health care, you also have to be mindful of big numbers, especially when they come from that mysterious point out there called Washington, D.C. The government stargazers in Washington, for example, have determined that they are, and I see Mary kind of confirm this, between 31 and 38 million uh, Americans under the age of 65 who lack health insurance. Now, this is not, I think we'd all agree, an insignificant statistic at all. No matter what the figure you choose to believe, we still know there are massive numbers of people unprotected against this health crisis. But as you follow this debate, keep in mind that the same government which produced these figures can't determine, even within a few billion dollars, how much more it's going to spend this year than it's going to take in. To quote from the government's latest official budget report, and I quote, even in the best of times, macroeconomics is a highly fallible science. The absurdity of this situation would be hilarious, frankly, if we, weren't, if we were only dealing with statistics. But as you know, we are unfortunately dealing with people and with human lives. Like those astronomers who think they found something big and mysterious in outer space, our government, the Congress in particular, has made an important discovery. <clears throat> they have discovered that our health care system could be on the verge of self-destruction. Now, about all we can do to avoid being devoured by a cosmic black hole is hope 
that we aren't around when this self-destruction gets here. But on the other hand, there is something we can do to alter the course of our health care system and prevent what now appears to be some inevitable implosion. Some would say that the best way to ensure that everyone has health care is to simply give it to them. Now that sounds simple. As I say, just give it to them. Herein lies the crux of the problem, I think, though. If there is one flaw in our democratic system of government, it is that those who are charged with making authoritative decisions, namely the Congress, have been able to deflect the responsibility for the legislation they pass. They not only exempt themselves from these major laws, but they go a step further. When their political antennae are t finally tuned to sense the slightest change of public opinion, our politicians have institutionalized a give the voter most about anything they want system of making laws. The secret to political success in America appears simple. Avoid confrontation, duck responsibility, and appease any outspoken group that wants something. This is the reason our federal budget deficit continues to grow unchecked. Congress seems not able to say no. Even worse, Congress has institutionalized this practice of saying yes at your and my expense. The idea of mandated health care is thus a politician's dream. It requires no hard work, no serious thinking. It appeals to a large number of people who don't have to dig in their pockets to pay for it. And it is tailor-made concept for those who thrive on ducking responsibility. All they have to do is point a finger at the nation's employers and say, you do it. And politically, the odds work in the favor of the Congress. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that there are more votes among employees than there are among employers. Let me remind you of another time when Congress took us down that same primrose path. Not long ago, our lawmakers felt that they could improve the operations of our lending institutions. So someone came up with a mandate to deregulate the nation's financial institutions. America's health care system might just be another financial institution disaster waiting to happen. All it will take is for Congress to opt for the easy, short-term answer. We believe that's what a mandate is. There is a fundamental law of physics that you cannot create something from nothing. If business owners are forced to provide health care, they will have no alternative but to find other ways to make ends meet. Some will have to cut back on employee paychecks. Some will have to cut back on hours that the employee works. And worst of all, some will respond to layoffs and less job creation. Some, especially small struggling businesses, will actually be forced to close their doors. You cannot create something from nothing. That's why mandates are not only prone to fail, but they create serious damage when they keel over. Mandates for businesses equal less jobs, fewer hours, lower pay, and less opportunities. When a person has no job, rest assured, he or she will have no benefits. No benefits, no health insurance. Even Congress cannot, cannot force a business that is closed to provide health coverage. As this debate sharpens, I predict you'll see the reemergence of an old, tried, but true lobbying tactic perpetrated on the nation's business owners with increasing regularity. Supporters of mandated health care will attack not the substance of the problem, nor the lack of will of our political leaders, but the integrity of the free enterprise system. You and I both have seen that happen before. First, they will use the old argument that this is America, land of the free, land of opportunity, where all of us should have anything we want. They'll say health care, it's not a benefit, it's a right. The underlying message here is that business owners are cold, callous people who care only about making a profit. Supporters of government mandates portray business owners in the image of Ebenezer Scrooge playing with his gold coins while Tiny Tim is dying from neglect, lack of health care. 
This is an old scheme and unfortunately one that we view with increasing concern. But the blame business approach does not end there. Next, the mandate crowd will likely trot out the old standby argument that health insurance doesn't really cost as much as the business community claims. They'll say companies can afford it if they really want to. But before you buy all of that, ask yourself these questions. Is health insurance a right or is it a responsibility that should be shared? Are business owners uncaring, greedy people? Does health care and therefore health insurance cost too much or is that a myth? Health care is not a right. The primary responsibility for health care lies, I believe, with the individual. At the same time, in today's labor market, no business owner can afford to ignore, I don't believe, the needs of his or her workers. I know from numbers of recent surveys that more than two-thirds of all small business owners offer health insurance of some form as a fringe benefit. I also know that 90% of those who don't offer it simply cannot afford the coverage. On average, businesses are having to pay 20 to 30% more each year for coverage than they did the previous year. Last year, nine out of 10 small business owners responding to a survey said that health insurance was becoming prohibitively expensive. However, in that same survey, small business owners said that they believe all Americans should have access to quality health care regardless of income. How do we resolve that dilemma? And it is a dilemma, especially to the frustrated small business owner. I would like to take a moment here before I complete my remarks to look at a vehicle that might provide the answer. It's the question of markets. I'm a pretty big, big free market advocate. I believe markets work. They can work to help us achieve objectives or they can work against us, but I believe they will work and woe to those of us who might forget it. I believe that is true of health care. The truth is, the health care market in this country works very well today. It works just as we expect it to work, given the incentives that have been built into the system. Health care is costly. Its prices are rising rapidly. Millions of Americans do not have health coverage. Bureaucracies increasingly make health care decisions for doctors and for patients. You could say these are terrible outcomes, and I think they are. No one likes much about the way that health care is delivered and paid for these days. But does this mean that market forces do not work when it comes to health care? I don't think so. It means that the incentives built into the health care system make markets produce outcomes that we don't like. It's not the fault of the markets. Rather, it is the result of perverse incentives that principally the Congress has built into the system. Health care reform simply means, therefore, creating a new set of correct incentives. Well, by now you're aware that I'm not at all pleased with our present congressional leadership's approach to the issue. But NFIB is doing more than just pointing fingers and calling names. We've offered several ideas to Congress and to the states that could help avoid this impending disaster. First and foremost, Congress should focus on not health insurance, but on cost containment. Cost containment is crucial to bring stability and predictability to the health care marketplace. Next, our political leaders can help ensure that af affordable insurance be available to all businesses and individuals by fostering competition in the insurance industry. Possible solutions include providing tax incentives, allowing state risk pools, limiting medical malpractice awards, and permitting companies to offer what I call essential care policies. These same policymakers can and must remove government barriers, such as state mandated coverages, there are 20 here in Oregon, and restrictions on health management organizations. 
and the politicians must clean up their own house with the Medicaid and Medicare program. Lawmakers must also allow equitable tax treatment of self-employed business owners who can now deduct only one-fourth of their health coverage costs. By contrast, corporations are allowed a 100 percent deduction. Another way to improve health care delivery is to eliminate costly burdens which force companies to continue coverage of former employees long after they've gone on to another job or retired. One can sum up the health care health insurance crisis in one word, responsibility. Congress must shoulder its responsibility to deal with the uncontrolled costs of health care. Employees must accept responsibility not only for sharing costs, but for their individual behavior as it affects their health. Responsible policies and equitable tax treatment for employers will encourage them to respond to the pressures of their society and its free market demands. Responsibility, good old-fashioned responsibility, is the bedrock of American democracy. It has served us well in the past. It will guide us to a workable, adequate health system which will meet the needs, I think, of all Americans without resorting to mandated health insurance. The black hole of the health care crisis is rapidly closing on the United States. Only when we demand realistic, long-term, responsible solutions from our elected representatives can we avoid falling into the abyss. Thank you. Uh, listen to this. Would you roll the tape, please? This might not work. I love brakes and a fuel injected 350. It's a beautiful car, and we hope you like it because you. Could you start it over again, please, and turn it up? Tom's For the benefit of Tom Stoneham, just bought a new Corvette. It's got dual overhead cams, anti-lock brakes, and a fuel injected 350. It's a beautiful car, and we hope you like it because you helped pay for it. Tom's making the payments with some of the money he saved by not buying health care coverage. As long as he stays healthy, no one gets hurt. But let's say Tom has an accident. And let's say the medical bills come to $100,000. If Tom doesn't have the money, his doctors and hospitals will pick up the tab, which means they'll have to raise their rates for the rest of us. It's not their fault. It's Tom's. And every other person who can afford medical coverage but won't buy it. If you know someone like Tom, tell them to quit fooling around and get covered. After all, if they want to live dangerously, that's their business. But if they want to make you pay for it, that's yours. A thought on reducing the cost of health care from King County Medical Blue Shield. I rest my case. <laughs> King County Medical Blue Shield in Seattle has been running these ads in order to help inform the public about some of the real fundamental problems in health care. And one of the real fundamental problems in health care is that some people pay for it and some people don't. Oregon passed a law a couple of years ago to deal with that issue, and that's what we're uh, discussing today. I'd like to start, though, I guess, with some disclaimers. I'm not an author of the bill. I didn't advocate it in the legislature. I don't advocate anything in the Oregon legislature. I can't really speak on behalf of the authors of the bill. I can't tell you all the policy implications behind it. I might get some of the facts right if you ask me what it says. I don't speak for A. Foster Higgins. I don't speak for the business group on health or my clients. This is one man's opinion, and I guess that's why they asked me today. We kind of have a health care cost problem. The NFIB is right. You may have noticed. 3600 bucks per employee per year last year is what the Foster Higgins survey showed. And we're forecasting 20,000 after the turn of the century. 20,000 bucks per employee per year. We didn't just make this up. This stuff is clipping along at 15, 20% a year. 
it is perhaps the single biggest financial issue this country faces particularly as we all age and we're going to need those health care benefits and the cost is a vicious circle in the circle the victims include those who haven't been able to afford it even when it was cheap and as it becomes more and more expensive and less and less accessible those people continue to be victimized and left out of the system the providers in turn who provide costs to those folks have to shift the uncompensated costs to the bills of paying patients and that cost shift is what King County's ad is about and mostly what my comments are about it's a circle that is difficult to break the Oregonian just this morning many of you probably read reported a study by the state indicating that hospital net revenues were way up admissions were way down the response of the hospital association was that our uncompensated costs are way up and we're shifting those and you're looking at these numbers wrong you got to look at look at it from the standpoint of how we have to recover revenues that aren't paid by non-payers who are non-payers well they include the federal government which is real good at it they passed Medicaid and Medicare and pumped a lot of money into health care and helped this inflation cycle get underway and they do provide a safety net for millions of Americans but when it comes to paying the bills they don't like to pay charges none of us do buying a car or buying health care so but when Uncle Sam doesn't want to pay charges he's allowed to, to do that he can negotiate a deal and that's exactly what's happened under Medicaid and Medicare not all of the charges of facilities and providers are paid so they contribute to that cost shift small business contributes only to the extent that they don't buy health insurance and this is not an issue between small business and big business because there's thousands and thousands of employers in Oregon who do provide health insurance who are small employers and in fact it's small business that's the greatest victim of the lack of coverage for everybody and the reason is that in big business my clients others have the ability to negotiate deals they can get discounts from providers and they do aggressively they selectively contract and steer their employees to manage care systems they can cut a lot of costs and then they become cost shifters too but the little guy can't do that he's a price taker his coverage is pooled he doesn't get to negotiate with anybody so to the extent that people aren't paying the full bill and it's shifted it's the small employer that's getting it Oregon thought they'd tee up an approach estimated that there are 400,000 uninsured in the state it has three components under Senate Bill 27 which I understand the City Club considered not too long ago they devised a mechanism to try and determine in some sort of a rational way they hoped what are the services and benefits that would constitute a basic entitlement to health care public and private and in a couple of weeks they're going to be making some tough decisions about what benefits are going to be on that list it's going to be very interesting that is the centerpiece and even though it involves benefits that would be delivered to the poor under Medicaid it's also intended to be the basic benefit package under the second component the one that we're here to talk about which is Senate Bill 935 under this program small employers have tax incentives to provide group health insurance coverage and failing to do that by 1994 will be subject to taxes in the amount of 75 percent of employee premium and 50 percent of dependent coverage the benefit model is supposed to be the benefits that are developed rationally under the first piece Senate Bill 27 House Bill 27 is it House Bill or Senate Bill who cares <laughs> the third piece is the uninsurables the high-risk pool and this piece addresses folks who just can't get coverage in the marketplace tie them all together and they called it the Oregon solution this is a model approach and Oregon likes to be a model as an Oregonian for some nine years and one who misses living here now I like the fact that the state wants to be a leader 
but in this area they've got lots of competition. So I'd like to take the plane briefly up to 50,000 feet and take a look at the rest of the country because we're not unique in this respect. Perhaps the most um, famous case is Hawaii. In 1974 they passed a prepaid health care act which required all employers to offer coverage. They got an ERISA exemption or an exemption under um, federal law which permitted them to go forward with the program in 1982. By 1990 only five percent of Hawaiians are without health care coverage. It's a remarkable achievement. On the other hand, business is screaming that it's expensive there. I don't think it's just health care. I think it's food and everything. But um, They are now bridging the gap uh, further with a state health insurance program for the non-Medicaid poor to pick up the other five percent. Let's go to the other part of the world, Massachusetts. 1988 Health Security Act required that all firms with six or more employees pay a surtax of about 1700 per employee per year or take a deduction of that amount up to that amount for amounts paid toward health care coverage for their employees. The employer mandate and tax was scheduled to take effect next year. It is now falling victim to budget and economic conditions to the disappearance of Michael Dukakis who by the way is now teaching in Hawaii <laughs> and a new Republican governor who's hostile to the concept. One of the key reasons for the for the failure or the prospective failure of the Massachusetts approach is the cost to small business of the mandated contribution level and that's something I'm going to come back to because that's an important component of success in these programs. You've got to have something that business can afford or you'll never get it off the ground. These are only the most visible initiatives. There's lots of others. Seven states have mandate waivers. This distinguishes between mandating coverage, which is what we're talking about, and mandating benefits, which means that certain providers have to get covered under every insured plan, or certain services must be in the plan. Usually mandated benefits uh, come about because the providers themselves go down and lobby for that in the state legislature, and, and uh, you know how the world works. Um, mandated waiver legislation permits for small group products in certain states uh, avoidance of these mandated benefit requirements and those states include uh, Virginia, Washington, Missouri, Kentucky, Rhode Island and Illinois. These kinds of initiatives coupled with insurance reform initiatives to make small business group insurance products more affordable, more accessible, have less exclusions, make it something that, uh, that uh, is available and attractive to small business and that they can afford have major promise in terms of expanding the kind of market initiatives that were discussed earlier. A number of other states have launched initiatives to expand coverage of the uninsured, including business uninsureds. Michigan has an access to health care initiative focusing on low-income families, children, and small employers, primarily through market reform. Arizona has a demonstration project using HMOs and PPOs as a source of care. California has a $25 per employee tax credit for employers with 25 or fewer. Connecticut has a blue ribbon health care policy for the uninsured. Small employers with 25 or fewer employees get premium tax waivers and a reinsurance mechanism to cover the risk. Florida has an HMO-based demonstration program. It's been operational since May 1989. Kentucky has a tax credit for previously uninsured businesses coupled with a reimbursement fund for hospitals who have a disproportionate share of charity cases. Maine has an HMO-based program for small business. New York has a pilot employer incentive subsidy program. Washington has a basic HMO benefit plan for small employers. So if any of you all were thinking about moving up across the border to get away from this Oregon deal, don't count on it. 20 states have established high-risk insurance pool for the medically uninsurable. 22 states have convened commissions to study health care finance and access issues, seven of which have completed their work. This is quite a roster. It's hard to be a model with that much competition. But Oregon's initiative is a little more creative and a little more aggressive than other states. But it's consistent with the trends everywhere. Employers who leave the state really have no assurance that the state they move to won't have an even tougher approach. And back in Washington, D.C., Senator Kennedy has something in store for all of us. If we fail to address the cost shift issue at the state level, it will be addressed at the national level, and you may like it a lot less. We'll lose the value of the creative laboratories, 50 of them across this country, to help us create a model that works based on competition, based on the market, 
based on the values that we've been able to create to date in our system of health care coverage. We need to build a national structure that works. We can't do that unless we have experiments. I'd like to leave you with three brief final thoughts. First, states should do everything possible in these programs to facilitate employer participation. They should not be too aggressive about requiring that the employer cover everybody, everybody who works even a couple of hours a week or let's say 17 and a half hours a week. They need to have an approach that's designed to make the program affordable and get buy-in by business. They have to address appropriate benefit levels and appropriate cost sharing. Senate Bill 27 or House Bill or whatever it is, the one that mandates the benefits may be a challenge in this respect because when they go down that list to try and create the basic benefit plan that's applicable to Medicaid and partly federally funded under Title 19, they are also supposedly creating the plan that's going to go to the small employer group. If those benefit levels are too rich and Medicaid nationally is going to require them to be very generous because you can't cut back to the satisfaction of Congressman Waxman the basic entitlement under Title 19 and expect to preserve it. So you've got a contradiction there. Oregon's going to have to get creative in addressing that approach, and I think they're trying to do that right now. Second, small group market reform should go forward with or without these mandated coverage laws. It's necessary. We're not going to have the kind of coverage available to small employers that they deserve unless there's market reform. Third, this ain't rocket science. Oregonians have tougher problems than this. They have solved tougher problems. They certainly face tougher ones. Old growth forests, owls, salmon, and ballot measure five limits come to mind. This is solvable if we work together to make it work and if we make the investment in containing health care costs to make it affordable for everybody. Chuck Williams, member of the Board of Governors, has the privilege of asking the first question. Chuck. Thank you, Mary. Well, it looks like you've both learned the uh, Oregon motto, slightly uh, adapted from the Nike motto, and we'll call it uh, just you do it. We're talking about whether it's cost shifting or uh, mandated benefits. Um, question for uh, either of you, maybe John, you could start. Um, reducing health care insurance costs is going to require a lot uh, more restriction on choice of physicians, restrictions on uh, choice of hospitals. That's already happened to a large extent. Do you see this happening more and more, and how is business going to uh, react to that? Is that a reasonable way of doing business? Interesting, as I hear the question, is it, is it as a price of containing costs carry with it automatically some limiting of choice? I have to try to simplify it to as much. And I think that really looks at the heart of some of what we Americans are going to have to look at. You know, sometimes we have thrown, it's happening a bit in California right now, well, if we only adopt that Canadian system, boy, can we get it under control. Yep, if you want a certain level of health care rationing, back to limiting choice, uh, that's what you would probably get. I'm not convinced that Americans yet are ready, after we've had all these years of having about all the health care we would like to to get and willing to pay for, um, or let somebody else pay for, um, we're willing to deal with some rationing of health care. Um, my suspicion is, is that to some degree, uh, there would be some willingness to deal with some limit of choice. Uh, I'll now speak to it maybe from the standpoint of being uh, the employer and not the trade association. And, uh, and in our health care plan, the employee has a choice of taking the general go to whoever you want plan or taking the HMO plan, which limits the choice. Uh, especially in Washington, D.C., and in the San Francisco area where we have a concentration of people, I am interested in seeing the number of employees that opt for the HMO route, which is a form of limiting choice by them in exchange for two things. A bigger share of the cost is paid for by us because it costs less. Uh, and an interesting aspect beyond your question is the HMO offers some wellness coverage which the standard insurance doesn't. So my sense from my own experience as an employer is, yes, they would accept some limiting of choice uh, if it really directly helped bring down the cost. 
you have anything to add, Mr. Oh, Brown? what was the question? <laughs> <coughs> Will they Limited accept choice. a limitation on choice? That really just goes to the heart of, of the problem. The problem on cost is that we know it's going up like crazy, and we don't do anything about it. The employer community, um, you know, you have to measure your success one spoonful at a time, but, but the employer community in the next five years is going to have to look at some very dramatic changes in the way it organizes its funding of uh, health care benefits for employees. And uh, at the heart of it is going to be uh, uh, directing employees to cost-efficient quality providers. Um, all of this um, uh, doesn't seem too dramatic, I guess, from the standpoint of people who think they've done something by having a PPO or an HMO, and so their renewal was only 15 percent, it wasn't 30. But the reality is that you just can't absorb those kind of costs over time. And sooner or later, the issue is gets to the CFO's desk and the president of the company. And at that point, you're looking at scheduled benefits and you're looking at cutbacks and you're looking at less access. So yes, I think that employers will be increasingly willing to limit freedom of choice, but I don't think that they have quite faced up to it yet. Dr. Constance Rodman has the privilege of the second question. A question for Mr. Sloan. Um, Senate Bill 935 legislates that small business contribute $40 a month for employees for health insurance by January 1994. And this bill was supported by both the associated organ industries and unions and extends insurance coverage to 150,000 Oregonians who are currently employed and have no health insurance. This bill was opposed by the National Federation of Independent Businesses. How else would you propose to access health coverage for these particular Oregonians? Uh, certainly not through a mandate. Um, I'm, we certainly urge members to provide health care. I'm pleased to say that over two-thirds do. As you probably gathered my early comments, 90 percent of those who don't, don't because of cost. Um, <clears throat> that plan that's due in 94, unfortunately, has some of the same um, uh, fallacies that the Massachusetts plan referred to by Mr. O'Brien has. And I'm afraid that your plan outlined in Senate Bill 935 due to take effect in 94, as I understand it, is a major reason why we think it's uh, another one of its uh, weaknesses and shouldn't be adopted, is the experience that, that is being dealt with in Massachusetts. Let me take a step beyond Mr. O'Brien's comments because he was, uh, he really was pointing out how that uh, an experiment uh, in one of the states is proving that this system uh, is likely not to work. Uh, passed in 88 to help give Governor Dukakis an issue. There's, again, interesting, it didn't take a shift of parties to undo it. The same Democrats who can have always controlled the Massachusetts legislature, while Governor Dukakis was still in office, realized that it was shifting uh, or placing the cost squarely on the taxpayers of Massachusetts back to make up the differential, and that they didn't have the money in the coffers. Uh, in the years since then, two years, the economy's gotten even worse, so the hole is even worse. So that same Democratic legislature in 1991, in the last month, as a matter of fact, has voted to delay it another two more years. I think that's what you were referring to. Interestingly enough, the governor, who happens now to be a Republican, vetoed that bill because he sees that as just putting off the inevitable, that this type of system won't work. And as a result, uh, we think until a system is looked at that looks more at how to help the small business owner deal with the cost rather than automatically requiring them to pay it, uh, we just can't support the mandate. Let me want you one thing about this S. 935, as I understand it. I got to make that caveat because I may have missed something. I think, again, Mr. O'Brien made the comment, as I understand, the business owner must pay 50 percent for the cost of the employee, no, excuse me, 75 percent for the employee, 50 percent for the employee's family. Who's going to pay the difference? Better be sure you ask that. It's my understanding this bill puts a cap of something like 15 bucks a month 
on the employee. There's a vast gap between that $15 and the 15.75%. Now, right now, I put a pretty hefty wager on who will pay for it. You'll pay for it as the taxpayers of the state of Oregon. And the question is, how is the funding of that being developed? It's a slight variation of Massachusetts because theirs was the fixed $1,700 that was mentioned. Yours does have a floating level that could drive it up, but it still offers a substantial gap. And I understand the plan really hasn't looked at where the revenue for that's coming from. Uh, this ain't Massachusetts. I think we can solve this problem. I think the key is flexibility. There's now an implementation bill before the legislature. This is the law now. When we talk about Senate Bill 935, it ain't a Senate bill. It's in the Oregon Revised Statutes. There is an implementation bill right now that is being negotiated. I think it's very constructive. It's attempting to try and avoid the Massachusetts rigors, and I think it goes to the issue I talked about. You need to get this thing up. It's a good idea. In order to do it, you need to not be too precious about requiring the employers to cover all kinds of services and everybody. You need to do it in a way that's realistic and affo affordable to small business. And I think Oregonians can probably figure that out. Let me continue on that because we raised the subject. <clears throat> there are market ways that you can deal with it and get your cost down. Um, I mentioned in my comments the idea of, of pooling, whether it's state or community. See, the problem that's hurting the small business owner today is most big businesses have opted out of that system, and under ERISA, they're able to. Uh, they run self-insured plans. They are free of the state mandates. They are free of a lot of the things that the poor small business owner is not free of because he or she has to go buy in the plan, be faced with the mandates. Uh, much less flexibility. Again, well, Mr. O'Brien covered that aspect pretty well, too, about it is a small business owner who's somewhat caught in the middle. We'd say very caught in the middle. Um, I would encourage uh, small businesses in the community here to look at pooling their effort. The Small Business Association in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, has a great record of coming together and going out and pricing care as an entity so they greatly spread the risk and they negotiate the fees. Uh, they've set a pretty interesting example that we think could be copied by a lot of communities. We hear it's being uh, uh, started up in Denver and a pilot system is being tried in Nashville, Tennessee, just to give some idea. So there is a market vehicle for trying to help bring down cost. Uh, Oregonians are uh, looking at pooling uh, <coughs> as an approach. That's what Senate Bill 935 does. Kathy. Kathy Oxborough, City Club member. I have health insurance, and I like my health insurance a lot, and I use it, but it seems to me that it protects me from the true cost of my health care, and I, I'm sure I might make different decisions or at least would affect my uh, decision-making process when I go for services if I had to pay that full cost. Do you see that as a problem? Could you comment on that? See, it's a problem all over the country. Um, and one way you deal with it, I think, is look at what you have as your core insurance requirement and what you have as the deductible. Um, if you're using a deductible in the range of $250, $300 or so, you, you have the employee sharing in the decision. Um, I think what most of us really want, most of us in this case, the employee, the person, is protection against catastrophe. What we really don't need is an expensive transfer system where every last dime is virtually paid, which is to some degree what we have in some cases. So I would urge you to look at having a reasonable uh, deductible that makes sure the employee is participating, therefore helping make the decision, do I need to do this or not? And second, that the uh, co-insurance factor helps them have a stake. One caveat I'd put on the county side that I picked up in looking into the issue that you have to be careful about, I think, is making sure that you don't make it such that you really encourage a situation like this where the expectant mother decides, I really don't want to get the proper prenatal care because that's not good for either her, your employee, or good for you, the employer. 
we have found in our own plan that the most expensive medical task we have to deal with uh, is for the premature child generally uh, arriving because of improper prenatal care. So there, that's one where both the employer and the employee are winners if you make sure you look at that very carefully. Uh, in fact, what's gone on to uh, address uh, health care costs uh, by employers uh, who have uh, coverage uh, in the last five years or so particularly is that we've shifted the cost to the employee. I mean, that's been the solution that our clients and uh, business generally has resorted to, uh, and that's what Foster Higgins survey results show, that increasingly, you know, deductibles are going up, the employee is bearing more and more of the cost. That's great for a couple of years, but then you get to the point where the employee doesn't have the financial wherewithal to absorb those costs. You've got to address managing the health care itself. You've got to look at systems that limit absolute free choice of provider, that have incentives for employees to go to cost-efficient providers. You've got to be careful that those systems uh, measure and uh, preserve quality. And uh, uh, all this is hard, too, but it is doable. Um, so you're right, you know, if you have first dollar coverage, I mean, that's what's led us to a lot of the problem that we're in in terms of fueling health care inflation. But the cost shifting solution is about done. We've done about as much of it as we can. Now, I mean, a lot more of it's going to go on, but it's really not addressing the underlying uh, inflation uh, problem. Let me add, um, I, hate to, I hate to give um the other panelists are plugged this way, but as a matter of fact, NFIB's own employee plan uh, has been designed for us by Foster and Higgins, and it has helped us greatly deal with exactly those told issues. Me that. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't too early. <laughs> Next question. Charles McLean, City Club member. Mention has been made of self responsibility, and when the Surgeon General tells us that 65% of health care costs are due to my lifestyle choices, how do you build in incentives and disincentives that are appropriate relative to containing costs in the area called prevention? And secondly, when my internist talks to me for 20 minutes about my choices and the consequences in a preventive way, they get paid X. When the surgeon does a two minute, 10 minute, 20 minute procedure, they're paid 10 times X. What equitability in rewarding prevention behaviors do you see built into the system? Uh, you raise a very good question. We're just at the beginning of that kind of, of design work. There are some employers who've installed uh, 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 cost-sharing provisions in their uh, health benefit plans to adjust them based on lifestyle risk, like if you smoke, you've got to pay a lot more on a contribution. Uh, there are employers, too, who have done risk appraisals of their employee population and help the employees understand what their lifestyle risk factors are and then integrated that in terms of employee education efforts and then had on-site programs. The trouble with all of that stuff is it's really hard so far to measure outcomes. It's really hard to see an impact on the financial bottom line because the way health care shows up for the employer is in claims, and claims translate into premium when you add expense and profit and administration. But uh, when you look at the claims experience, it's very tough to translate that back in most situations to individual lifestyle risks, and yet we know that a lot of our health care costs, and particularly acute care costs, are related to lifestyle risk. One of the things that's, uh, that's happening in our industry is that we're beginning to address total risk management in terms of employees and their behaviors. And that involves really health risk appraisal. It involves work site safety and other factors like that. With respect to your second question, um, physicians, um, I, I, took, I took the question to be, how come, how come your, your office visit is expensive or is that? Well, Medicare is about ready to drop a big one on us in that respect. Um, they've decided that that's true, and they've decided that primary care physicians ought to get more relative to specialists. And they are implementing a new physician payment system uh, even as we speak. 
and uh, what's going to and seminars are going on all over the United States to physicians to how to cost shift off of that and upcode and what have you. I'm not saying physicians spend all their time figuring out how to maximize their income, but uh, they're they're fairly good at it. And uh, <laughs> in any event, um, um, me the, the the Medicare uh, system is designed to try and rationalize that process that's just sort of crept up. Uh, specialists and uh, acute care is uh, much more expensive than primary care, and Medicare is trying to rationalize it and, of course, save money. That's really what they're doing. Is it part of this cost, uh, Bob, that's, uh, that small business is struggling with, we're talking about, somewhat brought on because of this massive cost shifting caused by Medicare and Medicaid paying below the fee structure and it being shifted over to the other side of the market? I mean, so instead of a cost containment effort, by setting the prices in Medicare, it really is more of a cost-shifting mechanism. Is yeah, that Medicare, a Medicaid, and employers who don't have group insurance. One last quick question. Harold Waite, City Club member. This is addressed to Mr. O'Brien. Uh, how would you deal with the problem of the uninsured person, the person who's working less than 17 and a half hours that wouldn't qualify, or the employee who declines to enroll as dependents? because of his share of the cost. I realize p the unemployed people are outside of the, the scope of uh, the mandated benefits, but some of the people are. Uh, that's a very good question, and it's a very difficult issue. I, I don't know how you deal with that, but my perspective is that we can't solve everything. We can just make incremental progress in expanding uh, coverage options and making uh, coverage available. I mean, if you draw the line at 17 and a half hours, then the people below that, you know, don't get it. Um, there's always some break point that's very difficult to justify in any kind of a rational way. But what it comes down to is having a reasonably affordable approach to extending universal access and reducing the cost shift. Uh, that's, that's the first, I guess, part. The second part is that uh, ultimately the government has some responsibility uh, for people who uh, are locked out of the system. I guess they don't have to step up to it, but increasingly among those state initiatives that I was referencing, uh, I focused on the ones that tend to focus on small business, but there are a ton of them related to the uninsured poor that are very promising approaches. Uh, so that people who only work part-time and don't make very much money, uh, people who are at 300% uh, of the poverty level, uh, you know, and can't qualify for Medicaid, couldn't even come close in this state, uh, are being picked up under those state initiatives. Uh, the complication there is that the biggest single issue that the National Governors Association faces, and I know Governor Gardner in Washington has been struggling with this and trying to find a way out of the wilderness uh, on Medicaid, is that the government sets the benefit levels and then provides part of the financing and the state ends up with a defined benefit that it's got to deliver to this population and they don't have the dough. And when you bring along a ballot measure five, you're in big trouble. So I don't want to just sit here and say, yeah, the government has a responsibility and they should step up to it. It's a very complex issue. I don't think we have an answer to that. Please join me in thanking our speakers for today and we are adjourned. <laughs>